Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS. Thanks for those joining us in person as well as those joining us online. We are glad that you're here. Our discussion today on celebrating women and girls, change agents for food and nutrition security in conflict settings, we're going to be looking at both the challenges of persistent gender inequality as well as the inspiring strength and resilience of women and girls. The experts that we brought together for this program will be looking at the issue both from a humanitarian and a development lens, focusing predominantly on fragile states or unstable environments. The conversation, which also includes all of you in the room, I really wanted to go beyond just elevating the importance of gender sensitive investments because we all know that's important. I want us to dig a little bit deeper into what kinds of interventions work best. I want us to think through how donors, how governments and partners can better harness the strength of women and maybe explore the gender dimensions and social norms that are either overlooked or just not discussed as much in the food security and nutrition space from everything of thinking about how women can be used um, or their role in peace building activities as well as the impact of things like child marriage. This event is a collaboration between the CSIS Global Food Security Project, which I direct, as well as the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Vimlinda Sharan, who's the director of the FAO Liaison Office here in North America. And I want to start by sharing um, that the idea for this event to focus on women and girls was actually Vimlinda's vision. And that's important because it's, we need male leaders and male voices in this. And while it's great that we have International Women's Day every year to focus on it, we need to extend that conversation well beyond that day and talk about this on a regular basis. Um, Van Lender has been in his position for almost a year and a half now, a little over a year. Um, his background includes being um, working for the government of India, his home country, in a number of positions for decades, um, including representing India um, in Rome uh, as a representative to UN agencies. I can say that he's a very thoughtful leader and we're very grateful for his partnership. Van Lender, over to you. Thank you, Kimberly, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me start by uh, quoting uh, the UN Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres, on his uh, remarks on the uh, on 8th of March when he was addressing the United Nations on the International Women's Day. He said, and I quote, achieving gender equality and powering women and girls is the unfinished business of our time and the greatest human rights challenge in our world. Gender inequality and discrimination against women harms us all, unquote. I think nothing could be closer to truth than this, especially in conflict settings where women most often bear the crippling consequences, whether it be physical, psychological, economic, social. But we also need to look beyond this, especially in conflict setting. For women, I feel, are agents of change. They are brokers of peace and they are the deliverers of assistance. And we have to therefore celebrate women's role in bringing about food security and nutrition, especially in conflict situations. And beyond that, their whole overall role in development of the society. A special effort therefore must be made for full participation of women planning humanitarian responses as we go ahead. I remember Farah Karim, Executive Director of Action Aid in Bangladesh, once saying that we cannot afford to leave women out of decision making, learning, designing, and budgeting. For to do so would mean to lose out 50% of the perspective, 50% of the ideas, and much of the practical solutions. So women in the scheme of things are absolutely imperative, and there's no way that we are going to succeed if we ever think that we can do it without women. FAO has acknowledged the importance of better conceptualizing the linkage between food security, sustaining peace, and gender equality. As a result, we are committed to mainstreaming gender issues over all our strategic programs, and especially for increasing the resilience of livelihoods to threats and crisis. I'm sure Ilaria Sister, who joins us from FAO, would be speaking more on these aspects and more about FAO's role in food 
in providing food security and nutrition in conflict settings, and especially how gender plays out in that scenario. We also have, with today, Kavita Nandini Ramdas as our keynote speaker. Last night, I was trying to research a bit, trying to put my thoughts together. How do you introduce a person who has achieved so much, given the fact that I had only four minutes or five minutes time? And when I read her bio, it was going to two or three pages, and I thought that would be too much. So I, I did a bit of digging, and thanks to Facebook and Google for that, though we are all quite critical about it these days. And I came across one speech of hers, which dates back to 19th May 2013 in Mount Holyoke College, where she was one of the four awardees for the annual honorary degree. And addressing the students, uh, she said, we need women who are so strong they can be gentle, so educated they can be humble, so fierce they can be compassionate, so passionate they can be rational, and so disciplined that they can be free. I think this one line really gives us a deep dive into the thought process, commitment, and passion with which Kavita is working on issues around gender. She's a visionary leader and globally recognized advocate for gender equity and justice, and an inspirational speaker, as we'll all see in a few moments from now. From 1996 to 2010, Kavita led and transformed the Global Fund for Women as the second president and CEO to become the largest public foundation for women's rights in the world. Later, she headed the Ford Foundation's operations in South Asia and, a couple, and for a couple of years, and over the last one year, she was the senior advisor to the foundation's president on global strategy. She's currently working as a strategy advisor to Masri, an organization which partners with grassroots women's organizations facing war, disaster, and injustice to meet their basic needs as a bridge to develop their advocacy and leadership. Who better than Kavita Ramdas to kick off today's discussion on women and girls as change agents for food security and nutrition in conflict settings? Ladies and gentlemen, I invite all of you to give a big round of applause to all the women working in dire circumstances, ensuring food security and nutrition for their families, and also a big round of applause for Kavita Ramdas. Kavita, the stage is yours. Salam, namaste, and good morning. Uh, my warm thanks to Vimlendra for that wonderful introduction. It's very nice when you arrive in a place and immediately feel at home because you have someone from your home introducing you. It feels really wonderful. Um, Kimberly, thank you so much. Also, um, both CSIS and FAO who have invited me. And I want to mention Nabiha Kazi from um, Humanitas Global who first put us in touch and who I'm sorry isn't with us this morning, but um, who has been a friend and a colleague. Um, I was invited to speak to you today about the critical yet often, as Vimlendra already mentioned, underappreciated role of women and girls in one of the most important aspects of human survival, ensuring that their families and their communities are able to feed and sustain themselves, particularly in the context of war and conflict. While CSIS focuses on issues of global security, which we often think of in sort of particularly masculinized terms of um, war, peace, and militarization, FAO was created to be the UN entity concerned about the production of the world's food and agriculture. Yet here we are at the end of the month that I like to refer to as Women's Her Story Month talking about how closely related these two topics are and how significant women and girls are to this particular her story. I want to begin first by talking a little bit about how persistent war and conflict are, despite encouraging comments by folks like Steven Pinker, who point out that it's a lot less than it used to be millennia ago. Two days ago, I was reminded by an article in The Guardian by Hind Abbas that um, we are almost exactly three years away from this day, the day that changed the lives of millions of Yemenis, 26th of March, 2015. Within hours, the sky in Yemen was filled with aircraft. People were shocked by what was happening, watching bombs fall. They thought this might last for a couple of days. 
Three days passed and it was still raining bombs from the sky. Three weeks have passed, three months have passed, and there was still war, and now three years have passed, and there is still a war in Yemen. To my mind, what is far worse than the fact that the war itself is going on is that very few leaders in the international community, much less the United States or the UK, which have armed and supported the Saudi Arabian-led attacks against Yemen, have had the moral courage to speak out against this travesty. And in this relationship between the two, more than 8 million people in Yemen today are on the brink of famine. People do not know where their next meal is coming from. The people who are organizing and raising awareness on this matter are not, unfortunately, leading nation states, but women's rights groups and human rights groups, including Code Pink, the Noble Women's Initiative, and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. As I said, I wish that I could say Yemen was one of few places where there is active conflict today. Everyone in this audience knows that that isn't the truth. In the Middle East alone, thanks to the US-led invasion of Iraq, that also we'll be celebrating, I don't know if celebrating is the right word, but commemorating a 15-year engagement that has affected millions of people. Multiple simmering conflicts have been created. Um, millions more have been displaced and pushed Europe into a defensive posture around the willingness to accept refugees who are fleeing from guns, bombs, and all kinds of violence, including, of course, various forms of sexual abuse. What we tend to hear in the news and in humanitarian pleas for assistance is that women and children are vulnerable victims of these wars and acts of violence. And of course, statistics bear that out. According to the UN's Population Fund, of the current population in the world, some 125 million people, 75% of those requiring, <clears throat> that is currently in need of humanitarian assistance, 75% of those are women and children. During times of war, everyday living becomes an impossible project, with things like being able to access your basic livelihood becoming absolutely inaccessible. Add to that the fact that we now recognize that rape and sexual violence are not like some side, you know, what did we used to call it in the shock and awe, collateral damage of um, the strategy of war. In fact, it is um, as we have seen in Bosnia, in Rwanda, in Guatemala, in Libya, Democratic Republic of Congo, rape and sexual violence are carefully constructed strategies to pivot action against the enemy. Evidence has shown that in Libya, sexual violence was employed as a war tactic, including armed soldiers being given Viagra to enable the rape, the, the rape statistics and the rate of rapes at a very high level. This use of um, um, using women's bodies as a way to define masculine um, power over the enemy um, is unfortunately also just as often caused by people within so-called um, supportive or friendly forces, and as we have seen in recent years, even by the people whose names are peacekeepers. In addition, recent IFPRI research has shown that food insecurity can be both a cause of as well as a consequence of conflict. Conflict, of course, reduces food availability and access when agricultural production and markets are disrupted. And then food insecurity, in turn, can trigger, a <clears throat> can trigger an array of responses from food riots to revolution. Whatever the cause, many millions of people are affected, and a large proportion of those affected can and do become refugees. When that process isn't coordinated or supported well, as we have seen again in the last few years, refugees cause further instability when crossing borders, including rising food and nutrition insecurity. And for those of us sitting in the comfort of Washington, D.C., I will remind us that it is actually the world's poorest countries that accept the largest numbers of refugees time and time again, whether that is Bangladesh, where we just heard um, about, or whether that is um, Jordan or um, Pakistan, where over 5 million Afghan refugees have been living. Um, that plight is something that I think nations that argue that they can only accept 10,000, as in this one, or 1 million, as in the European context, um, have no idea what it actually means to receive 600,000 Rohingya over your border within a, you know, a span of barely three weeks. Um, this same report notes that of, as of 2013, 
over 46 percent. So that's a little, that's almost half of the world's population in the developing world live in countries affected by civil conflict or war. Um, of course, these conflicts are increasingly also sparked or fueled by climate change and security situations. I'm a feminist, as I was introduced, and I think of these um, narratives as sort of um, a little bit of the exchange between history and herstory. And in this context, I want to talk a little bit how I think, in some ways, the term food security is a history um, narrative versus food sovereignty, which I think women's organizations have been putting forth in the last 20 years. So while I think it's important for us to understand how war and conflict affect women and girls and children around the world, I think it's even more important for us to understand how crucial women's voice, participation, experience, and leadership have been and are going to be in resisting and transforming both the current conflict framework and the current framework of so-called food security. For over 60 years now, close to 70 actually, since the end of the Second World War, the world has been fed a dominant narrative about what progress and development should look like. Not surprisingly, it's the victors of war and the former colonial powers of the world who dominate and shape history. history. And it was a his story, written to glorify the positions and perspectives of what we now refer to as the global north. In that narrative, the expansion of free market capitalism and industry was also applied to agriculture. The idea that food should be grown where it could be grown most cheaply and abundantly supplanted the notion that local was better, that organic was the norm, and that every community and society should grow its own food. Under that rapidly globalizing capitalist economy, following many years of preparation under colonialism, poor developing countries were encouraged to grow cash crops for export to wealthy, northern, uh, to wealthy global north states, while they became increasingly dependent on food aid and imports to feed their own people. Only a very few countries which had larger economies that also initially resisted full integration into the global trade structures, including the country I grew up in, India, were able to resist and build some modicum of self-reliance for food. Yet even in those societies, the larger emphasis on an industrialized production of food through technical advances like the Green Revolution were often pushed at that time without the knowledge of what we now know about how such forms of large agriculture, industrialized agriculture, increase nations' dependencies on fertilizers, on pesticides, and intensive irrigation methods that often depleted groundwater reserves, as well as created very deep inequalities between smallholder producers and largeholder producers who had the space and the amount of land that industrialized agriculture required. At the local level, women have always been key to the production of food in village communities across the globe, and I would add, not just in developing nations. The larger structures of discrimination against them began to make them more and more vulnerable. While they, do, while they did the lion's share and do the lion's share of work, both in the field and in the household, they rarely have control of the economic resources that were now structured as private property as opposed to the commons. Um, my sister, Sagari, works in, in villages across India, and we were just talking, Mera and I, about the fact that when you work with livestock, um, almost all agricultural livestock extension services are targeted at men because men actually own the animals. But who looks after the animals and feed the animals and takes care of the animals? It is disproportionately women in the community. So Sagari, trained as a veterinarian, um, was recognized many years ago by, the, by Ashoka as a change maker because she began to organize and mobilize women as, anim as animal health community workers. So grassroots barefoot vets, if you will. And it turned out that that has a series of ripple effects, because if you organize women to be able to do something that is valued in the community, i.e. save your livestock, um, it turns out people become really appreciative of what they did. And soon after that, these same women began to stand for elections in the village panchayats, um, the local village councils in India, and were beginning to be um, elected to positions where they had much broader sets of um, uh, an ability to make a difference in the community. What we know is that women actually played a vital role in the preservation of food, of which livestock, of course, are an important part. 
Women's well-being, education, and control of household budgets is actually the single largest determinant of whether communities suffer from lack of access to food, and increases in women's education, control over income, and increased life expectancy actually contributed to over 55% of the gains against hunger in the developing world in the 25 years between 1970 and 1995, as per a study conducted by the OECD. For me, certainly, my years both at the Global Fund for Women and now at Madre, and indeed just growing up in the context of India, we have seen how women's leadership and resistance to standard frames for growth and development have enabled them to challenge the status quo. In particular, women have challenged the notion that development rooted in a massive expansion of both consumption and extraction is the only way in which the world can make progress. Organizations of peasant and indigenous women from Chiapas to Mexico, uh, from Chiapas in Mexico to Telangana in India to Brazil, have called out the World Trade Organization for offering private companies like Monsanto and Cargill a monopoly on the most precious genetic material that does not actually belong to any one company or any one individual. Neither should it be put on the market for trade, for profit, but is actually the collective inheritance and legacy of the peoples of the earth and should be treated as a precious commons. The notion of private property and profit have been key to removing control of the most critical basic resources of food and water from communities and instead are now claimed by corporations. You see the irony when you walk into Starbucks and you see plastic bottles of water and they say, buy one of these plastic bottles and we'll improve uh, water access for communities around the world. And you're going, really? Plastic is helping people in the rest of the world have access to water? And you're wondering, what is that about? So the use of the term food sovereignty rather than food security was coined by a number of these peasant movements working together. Via Campesina, which brought many of these groups together, um, says and asks the question, profit for few or food for all? These local, women, these local movements are largely led by women who are arguing that food, agriculture, ecosystems, and cultures are deeply and intrinsically related to each other. And you can surely see the um, disconnect between everybody now in the global north suddenly getting woke and going to farmer's market and taking your little cotton bags to do your shopping. Well, we all grew up in the so-called third world doing exactly that on a daily basis. Our farmer's markets were not called farmer's markets. They were just markets where farmers came to sell food. <laughs> and yet, what you have exported to our part of the world is the exact opposite of what you now are seeing as kind of very you know, enlightened consumption patterns, which again, ironically, only the very rich in your countries can afford to buy because the normal practice of buying from farmers markets has been totally displaced by this massive industrialized um, production mechanisms. Food security, to my mind, does not distinguish where food comes from, nor the conditions under which it is produced or distributed. National food security targets are often met by sourcing food produced under environmentally destructive and exploitative conditions and supported by subsidies and policies that destroy local food producers but benefit global agribusiness. One example of this, USAID requires, requires that you use American food to address crises in different parts of the world. So never mind if the crisis is in Ethiopia, you're not going to get Kenyan wheat or rice to be able to help Ethiopians. You ship that damn food from Iowa all across the waters in a huge tanker that is using, you know, we don't want to count that carbon footprint. And then you bring it and you say, look how wonderful we are, we're bringing you food and supporting you. This is, this is you know, a clear way in which this hypocrisy you know, continues. Food sovereignty, on the <laughs> food sovereignty, on the other hand, emphasizes ecologically appropriate production, distribution, and consumption, social economic justice, and local food systems as ways to long-term tackle hunger and poverty and to guarantee access for all people. So for me, this missing link is actually we cannot have security, really human security, or peace without food sovereignty. And because women and girls are disproportionately the key to the production of food and the collection of water on most parts, in most parts of the earth, and because they are the most critical determinants of child nutrition in every part of the earth, their voices and their wisdom are key to being able to help us correct our ways. And it is part of the reason that her stories need to be told. 
quick scan in this room. How many of you know that we have a Nobel Peace Prize because a woman who was a prominent pacifist, Bertha Sophie von, von, von Sattner, shamed Alfred Nobel into creating one? How many of you knew that before I just said that to you? Honest answers, hands up. Okay, her stories need to be told. How many of you that know that the first ever woman elected to US Congress was an active pacifist, Jeanette Rankin? Hands up. Two, two in the room. She was the first woman to ever be elected to the US Congress from Montana, and she was an extraordinary pacifist and someone who was proud to be the first and only woman in that entire Congress to vote on the right for women to be able to have the right to vote. How many of you know that we celebrate International Women's Day, which we just mentioned, across the globe as a statement of solidarity with brave women workers in the United States who marched and went on strike to demand better wages and safer working conditions in 1905? About five people in the room. So we ignore her stories at our peril. When you work with women's movements, as I have done for over 25 years, you realize that whether it is on the south side of Chicago, where women living in public housing were organizing mom patrols to guard against drug violence in their community way back in the middle 80s when I worked for the MacArthur Foundation, or in Liberia, where women dressed in white and staged massive rallies to bring an end to the civil war in their nation, leading to the Nobel Peace Prize being awarded to Lema Bowie, Women have been taking risks and putting their bodies on the line to demand an end to violence that threatens their lives, their children's futures, and the sustainability of the planet. A woman activist from the Congo once said to me, a war is not just about the rape of women, it is about the rape of the earth. Women's movements do not separate out the massive trade in guns and weapons and nuclear armaments from the steady dispossession of their communities of the basic resources that they rely on. At a recent gathering at the Plowshares Fund, organized by the Plowshares Fund, I listened with awe to Native American activist Janine Yazi talk about how Navajo or Dene women are organizing in Navajo communities to resist the mining of uranium for nuclear weapons on their reservation and the dumping of nuclear waste on their lands. In Kenya, where Madre's partner Indigenous Information Network leads efforts to conserve water in rural communities, women are leading the effort to build on the lessons of green belt reforestation and claiming their natural resources again. In Nicaragua, women have built seed banks for their own crops, so they are not dependent on purchasing them from Monsanto. In India, the Food Sovereignty Alliance challenges the growing presence of bioengineered seeds and special nutritional crops like golden rice or special wheat reminding us all that good nutrition does not come from increasing vitamin yield in one product, but ensuring that all people have the right to a balanced and nutritious diet. You don't have to put everything into one seed. You have to make sure women actually have the ability to eat vegetables in addition to rice. Um, it's women rights activists like Bertha Cáceres who was killed for challenging the Honduran government and corporations who reminded us that we should be very suspicious indeed of solutions that are focused on offering a micro pill or a genetically enhanced miracle food to address issues of basic power imbalance that are actually caused by inequality and poverty. Of course, this inequality and the unequal position of women in all societies makes their struggle to be heard and to be recognized as leaders of an alternative vision for our future a very daunting struggle. As we have witnessed here in the United States over the past few months, it has taken decades of efforts to overcome the shame and the silencing of women to be able to speak up publicly about the entrenched forces of privilege and patriarchy that persist in every single industry across the globe, yes, even ours, in the not-for-profit sector. Even women who are relatively powerful by virtue of their education, their income levels, and their fame have been coerced into being silent about the use, about the abuse they have experienced. Poorer women who work in the informal sector face even more daunting odds. Yet, amazingly and inspiringly for us, they refuse to give up. Whether you look at efforts of the National Domestic Workers Alliance here in the United States or the Restaurant Opportunity Center United who are pushing for fair wages for tipped workers, it is women who are leading with guts, grace, and gumption. While the realities of conflicts in places like Yemen, Syria, Iraq, and the Congo 
are grim and pose huge challenges for women and their families, I remain stubbornly optimistic about the possibility of building stronger transnational ties between the climate defenders and the women peasants and farmers in the nations of Africa, Latin America, and Asia with women's rights, worker rights, racial and environmental justice advocates here in this country. There was a time when people who talked the tough language of war and national security did not wish to be bothered by the soft talk of food, water, biodiversity, and culture. There was a time when the only people who sat at decision-making tables, regardless of the issue or the nation or the culture, were men. There was a time when the nations of the global north assumed they would always set the terms of global trade and global power relations. But as the young people on our streets this Saturday, and Jennifer Hudson reminded us, quoting Bob Dylan, the line it is drawn, the curse it is cast, the slow one now will later be fast, and the present now will later be past, the order is rapidly fading, and the first one now will later be last, for the times they are a-changing. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wow, it's not every day that we get singing at the end of a keynote. That was beautiful, Kavita, beautiful. It reminds me of, of some couple of points I want to make. One is um, we have a program here at CSIS called uh, Smart Women, Smart Power, which I'm now going to find a way to get Kavita engaged in. Um, but, but with that program, we have a podcast, um, and I sat down last week with Ambassador um, Earthring Cousin, who many of you know. Um, she was a, a, she's been a leader in the food security space for a long time, um, including being the U.S. Ambassador to FAO, and more recently, the Executive Director for the World Food Program. But that podcast was launched today, so if you're interested in smart women who have a lot of power, like Kavita, please um, go to the podcast. You can find it on Apple iTunes or the CSIS website. A couple of reactions I just want to point out, um, Kavita. One, thank you so much for bringing up Yemen. At the beginning, I am shocked at how many people are not paying attention to Yemen. We have a large event that I'm leading through my humanitarian agenda efforts on April 5th uh, with David Miliband, who's the former UK foreign minister and the head and president C CFO right now of the International Refu Refugee Council. Um, and I, and I think that your point of people not having the moral courage is really something we need to think about as leaders for the U.S. and, and others. I also want to point out, since she brought up food aid, that many in this room are aware, but if you're not as much in the food security space as some of us, that there is legislation on the Hill right now on food aid reform, and that is a topic that's being talked about a lot. We'll see if it gets traction for many of us that hopes that it does. So moving on to our panelists, you'll see that um, Ilaria Sister is joining us by video conference from FAO in Rome. Alaria is a gender and development officer with nearly three decades of experience addressing the gender gap in agriculture and food security. She's done research looking at everything from climate change adaptation to peace and resilience building and national resources management, and she manages the Gender Capacity Development Program at FAO. After Ilaria speaks, we'll turn to um, Mara Russell, and Mara directs the Food Security and Resilience at CARE USA. Um, she spent her career designing and implementing programs working on food security and livelihoods and humanitarian programs, often in conflict settings. Her work aims to address social and gender-based inequalities while improving food security and resilience. And she has experience working in uh, many countries, but I'll just name a few, Northern Iraq, Somalia, as well as former Soviet Union. And last but certainly not least is Natasha Stevanovich fenn She's a researcher with the International Center for Research on Women, or ICRW. She's a senior sociologist, and she's been working for the past four years there on issues related to gender, violence, and 
and rights. She has a focus predominantly on child marriage and gender-based violence in conflict and non-conflict settings. Let's, and I've asked Kavita, as you've noticed, to stay with us for the panel. One, because I wanted to get her reactions to our speakers, as well as give you an opportunity to ask her questions when we get to that section of the program. Alaria, let's start with you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you today. And I would like to thank the Center for Strategic and International Studies, as well as the FAO Liaison Officer for North America for inviting me to this event that is so important. I would like to say also, when uh, I received the invitation for this event, I thought it was a very timely moment. As you are probably aware, just last week, FAO has presented the global report on food crisis for 2018. And this report has depicted uh, a rise in food crisis. We know that now it is estimated that 124 million people across 51 countries are facing food insecurity. And this represents, unfortunately, a 15% increase compared to 2017 and almost a 50% increase compared to the year before. We know that two thirds of these countries were in Africa and uh, where we have about 32 million people that uh, are food insecure. And the most affected countries are Nigeria, Somalia, Yemen, and South Sudan, according to this report. And these countries have a very urgent need for humanitarian action to save lives to protect livelihoods and to reduce hunger and malnutrition. We know that humanitarian action has uh, uh, largely contributed towards preventing large-scale famines, but there are exceptionally high demands in these countries for assistance. The conflict, as we are well aware, is considered the primary reason for the acute food crisis. And we know that many of the countries that are facing this acute food crisis are located in Africa and the Middle East. A second major reason uh, is also related to climate disaster, mainly the persistent drought that have played a major role in causing uh, poor harvest in, uh, for several years in countries that are already facing high levels of food insecurity in Eastern and Southern Africa. And the situation is really regrettable. And uh, especially if we take into account uh, the entering into force of the Sustainable Development Goals, which have set forth a global commitment to eradicate hunger, malnutrition, and extreme poverty by 2030. As recently stated by the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, Reports such as this give us the vital data and analysis to better understand the challenges. It is now time to take uh, action to meet the needs of those that are facing the daily scourge of hunger and to tackle its root causes. Let me talk a little bit about gender and uh, women uh, situation in the rural uh, context. We know that during conflict and crisis, men and women are affected in different ways. We know that children and women in need of nutritional support has significantly increased between 2016 and 2017. And this is mainly an area that are uh, affected by conflict or insecurity. Many of these countries also are facing uh, severe outbreaks of cholera that exacerbate the levels of acute malnutrition. We also know, and I've been working for over 30 years for, uh, in this issue in the agricultural sector, we know that rural women face more barriers than men in accessing natural and productive resources, services, the labor markets, and also they still have a very limited participation in decision making and planning. This situation makes them more vulnerable and also more likely to resort to riskier coping strategies and it's also very detrimental to the health and to the work burden. And this affects the food security of the entire households. Also, we are aware, and FAO has recently decided to focus much more on this very important issue, that conflict situations are often characterized by an increase of gender-based violence. And this not only affects the victims and the survivors, 
but also their families and the whole communities, as well as the peace and the prosperity of nations at large. Unfortunately, data shows that on average, one in three women have experienced physical or sexual abuse in her lifetime. But let's think also about something more positive. Uh, conflicts and shocks can also tend to change the gender roles and uh, social norms. And this can, in some cases, also have very beneficial effects on the welfare of the households. We have seen, for example, when, we, when women gain more control over the resources due to the disappearance of male workers, the household food consumption can increase and the levels of food security and nutrition can improve. Also, women's economic empowerment can lead to their greater voice in the households and community decision making. Analysis of experiences, for example, during the conflict in Somalia has shown that uh, women's contribution to household income generation has increased along with their decision-making power. Uh, similar studies have also been carried out in Europe, in Asia, and in Latin America, and they have found that armed conflict can increase female labor participation, even though the labor very often the women are provided is in uh, low-paid or unskilled work, and this often exposes them to unsafe and insecure labor conditions. FAO recognizes that we will never be able to achieve its mandate of eradicating hunger and rural poverty if they don't put uh, gender equality and women's empowerment in the, in the cent at the center of the fight against extreme poverty, hunger, and malnutrition, and also in any efforts to build sustainable peace. Uh, indeed, also in the case of FAO, uh, gender is considered a cross-cutting team. Our work is mainly to support member countries in designing and implementing gender-sensitive policies, uh, legislation, and programs. And our main task is to try to reduce the gender uh, gap that exists between rural men and women in terms of their access to productive resources and uh, services and local institution. We are spending a lot of uh, time also trying to see how we can enhance women's role in profitable agri-food value chain. A lot of our efforts are also dedicated to reduce women's work burden, because you're not only poor of resources, but you can also be extremely poor of time. Very often you go with very good intention introducing new income generation activity, but women are already working 18 hours a day and they don't have time to introduce a new activity. So Special efforts should be made also to support them in introducing labor-saving practices. Also, we are trying to make an increased number of efforts to try to increase women's say and participation in policy decision-making process and trying to see what kind of economic opportunities we can provide them to improve not only their individual but also their household well-being. Our work is done with both men and women. And uh, we are working at different levels. We are working at the level of individuals. We are uh, working at the level of institution, as well as trying to see what we can do to support the establishment of an enabling environment towards uh, gender equality and women's empowerment. Let me now focus on our specific work that we are carrying out uh, under the framework for action for food security and nutrition in protracted crisis. This framework for action was endorsed in 2015 by the Committee on World Food Security, and we are extremely happy because there is a specific guiding principle related to women's empowerment and gender equality. And this implies that many efforts are made to try to integrate gender and uh, women's issue in any effort made towards building a sustainable peace process and also in efforts to build resilient uh, rural livelihoods. The United Nations has also identified that both food security and gender equality are central to build a sustainable peace process in conflict setting. There is also a broad recognition that both men and women can play a very important roles in the economic recovery and the transition towards sustainable peace. 
And many more efforts have been made recently to try to see how we can involve more women in peace building processes, as well as in economic development efforts being made after conflicts. Food security intervention, we know, can contribute to build and strengthen the resilience to conflict by assisting countries and people to better cope with and recover from the crisis. And this is really being able to be achieved if we make a gender issue uh, for a specific focus in the development of any type of policies and programs that contribute to reducing inequalities and prevent conflicts by supporting a broad economic development. Last year, or at the end actually of 2016, we started a very successful collaboration with IDS, the Institute of Development Studies, and we wanted to see what were the linkages that exist between food security, uh, gender equality, and protracted crisis. And uh, our first effort was to carry out a literature review, and then we were trying to assess how uh, policy intervention can actually improve food security among population affected by conflict, sustain peace, and support gender equality. And after almost a year of work, we were able to develop what we call a conceptual framework and identify also five major pathways there for promoting a sustainable, a transformative approach to prevent conflicts and facilitate peace processes, which uh, while promoting also gender equality. Let me briefly explain what are these proposed pathways. First of all, we feel that it's essential that we support individual agency and we foster aspiration of people, men, women, boys, and girls. We need also to make many efforts to transform gender roles so that we can address the root causes of gender inequalities and improve the position of women within the household and the community. We also recognize that we need to acknowledge the important role that institutions during wartime and also an informal governance structure can play, and we should really invest in this existing informal mechanism. We need also to invest many more efforts to provide equal access to markets for men and women, and also try to improve the social cohesion in the local collective action. We know that to be able to work in these five pathways that I just explained, and we have a whole series of documents that uh, can better explain in details uh, what is the approach that we are proposing. We need time, and this will require a long-term change process. It requires strong evidence base and also a very serious commitment. I think it's extremely important that many more efforts are dedicated to collect sex and age disaggregated data so that we can produce the evidence that policymakers and decision makers can use when they design and they're targeting or they're implementing the intervention and their policy. Also, in the last few years, FAO has been given increasing interest for protection of individuals uh, that are at risk of gender-based violence. And this is done through our activity related to food security and nutrition, efforts towards uh, poverty alleviation, restoration and strengthening of rural livelihoods, which are all the shielding factors against gender-based violence. For example, we are participating in South Sudan, in Somalia and in Kenya with a SAFE initiative, the SAFE Access to Fuel and Energy. And our contribution is to provide fuel-efficient stoves and identify alternative fuels and also investing in the sustainable uh, natural resources for fuel. We know that this intervention in times of conflict can uh, reduce the risk of gender-based violence, especially for women and children who collect fuel, and reduce at the same time the time that they needed to, uh, to venture into risky areas. Also, to conclude, I would like to say that I'm very proud that our organization at the 2016, during the World Humanitarian Summit, has made 10 specific commitments focusing on achieving gender equality, 
and two specific commitments towards preventing and mitigating gender-based violence. We recognize that if we want to build resilience for men and women and boys and girls, we need to be able to support them so they can better respond to crisis and disaster and uh, try to recover for any type of crisis more quickly. And so I think this is a short introduction of what I wanted to explain about our work. And a lot of material can be shared with you as a follow-up to this uh, event, uh, explaining more in details our work. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now turn to Mara. Um, I'm really curious, as you talk about, to give us some country-level examples of some experience of how CARE is working on the ground on this. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I'd like to also thank CSAS for inviting CARE to uh, come and participate on this panel. And I am very excited to um, kind of share some examples from CARE's work. But before I do, I just want to kind of um, kind of lay out uh, from my perspective the fact that care really one of the key driving factors in terms of everything that we do as an organization is women's empowerment and gender equity. And that underlies and connects as well very, very um, intensively in terms of how we do our food and nutrition security work. And that is across the spectrum, whether it's a developmental situation or humanitarian situation, we always see these key levers as being part of how we respond. And um, there are three elements in our gender framework that play a role in terms of food and nutrition security. One is agency, which is women's ability to take action to improve, a uh, woman's ability to take action to improve her life and livelihood, which includes participating in agricultural or livelihood activities, her mobility, and also her ability to take positive action in caring for her children, her family, and her community. Um, and there are some really good examples that I'll share about that. Uh, relations, which really comes down to women's ability to make decisions and negotiate in terms of the key elements of her life, um, her education, her livelihood, and how income is used in the household, but also, very importantly, on decisions in her house, in her community. So things like participating in development planning, um, conflict resolution, and allocation of resources to people who are very much in need, victims of conflicts and disasters, and so forth. Um, and then structures, which is the impacts of laws, legal structures, and social norms on women's lives and livelihoods. Quite often, these social norms are reflected in legal systems, but even as legal systems change, we quite often see that these norms do not change and uh, that there is not an enforcement of these laws in many cases. And where this impacts in food and nutrition security most acutely is on ownership of assets, land, uh, and livestock, but also even in access to, to um, inputs and resources. So all of these things are very important and play a role in terms of food and nutrition security. Now, from the conflict and uh, humanitarian aspect, as Kavita has mentioned, um, as we have been discussing, the impacts on women and girls do tend to be more severe. And this is also something that we have found. There, um, the impact of um, sexual and gender-based violence is uh, something that women and girls must contend with, but also the fact that they're quite often the ones who care for everyone else. You know, when the men are leaving and they're, you know, taking their animals or they're running for cover, you know, women must stay behind, pick up the children, get their ailing, you know, uh, elders and, and maybe also ensure that they bring with them their key assets. Um, this can take time and that, that can be um, a difficult situation that, you know, they 
have difficulty coping with. So all of these things, um, you know, really do impact food and nutrition security for women and girls. Um, but it also is something I think that engenders resilience because they are always coping with these situations. Women and girls need to come up with ways that they can effectively improve their lives and livelihoods. And CARE has done some things to really improve that. One of the key things we have done um, across the spectrum, whether in humanitarian situations, developmental situations, is we always start with a gender analysis. And that looks at these key elements of agency relations and structures in relation to food and nutrition security. So what is impacting women? How is it addressing these underlying causes of uh, insecurity uh, in food and nutrition and, and malnutrition as well? Um, also, CARE uses five minimum commitments um, in their humanitarian programs. Um, to, that are across the humanitarian program cycle and at each stage uh, reinforce our team's accountability to, affect, uh, to the affected populations, especially women and girls. And these include things like analyzing how the crisis uh, distinctly affects family members, food consumption, food sharing practices within the household, and access to food markets for different members of the household. Um, we consult men and women separately to find out how they're being impacted um, by things like reduced mobility, um, about the different modalities of assistance. Are we providing the right assistance to women and girls? Are we addressing their needs, not just the needs of men? And this is critical in terms of how we do our responses, that we do start with looking at women's needs, women and girls' needs separately from men's needs. Um, and then if we are providing additional aid in some way, we look at ensuring that, these, that this distribution is done equitably and that there's adequate access to all and that it's safe. Um, we also provide unconditional assistance to those who lack physical ability. So that would include pregnant and lactating mothers, but also anybody with disabilities. Um, and we also provide feedback mechanisms, feedback complaints and response, mecha response mechanisms to ensure that we're not missing people and missing needs along the way. We also support women's access to and control over assistance. So we re register them separately as aid recipients, um, and we ensure that they are equally represented in relief committees. So. You know, we try to um, ensure that local relief committees include at least half women, and we also include female staff in the team who consult with them. Um, so I want to give you some examples um, of how this has played out in terms of some of our relief efforts. Um, and one of them is uh, looking back at the Somaliland drought um, last year, about in 2017, and the reason why I'm picking that year is because it was after three years of drought. And um, keep in mind that many of these households um, had actually migrated to different areas due to drought and also due to insecurity in other parts of the country. So this is you know, really people who have been, you know, moving about due to different risks. And many of these households had lost most of their livestock and were barely surviving. And in this context, livestock means survival. Yet, no, despite this, they had gone a very, very long time without additional assistance. And a lot of that had to do with over the years, care building up some uh, resilience um, through implementing various different activities like putting in place water systems so that people could access water. 
but also um, another one was the building of women's agency and assets through village savings and loans associations. Um, women were able, through these uh, groups, women were able to support one another and keep businesses going. So they were earning incomes. They were supporting one another. And through these savings and lending activities, they were helping the community weather um, drought conditions. And to some extent, it was the grandmothers, okay, who were involved with these groups, who were leading these groups. And one in particular that I want to talk about uh, was Shukri Muhammad Abdi, who's a grandmother of 24 um, in the village of Haro Sheikh. Uh, and she was a chairwoman of the VSLA group in that community. Um, and in that community, the women in the VSLA group um, came up with ways to feed people, not just from the community, but uh, who had lost their livestock, but people who were coming in from other areas surrounding the community who had also lost their livestock. So these are displaced by drought people who you know, are being supported in this way. Um, and uh, you know, the interesting thing about this, you know, these grandmothers coming together and you know, making decisions on how to do things is they also paid attention to things that maybe we from you know, our aid agencies based in Atlanta, Washington, DC, et cetera, might not pay attention to. So for instance, they came up with an initiative to um, pay some men to dig a ditch where uh, the, um, the dying livestock could be put as, you know, so that they would not um, cause disease for the rest of the community. And as the livestock were dying, they said, we're gonna make sure that people use this pit, okay? So really taking charge of the business of health and nutrition for the community. Um, and you know, when they were interviewed uh, to find out what you know, care could do more to support them, they didn't say, give us more food and money. They said, give us more business opportunities. Give us more opportunities to diversify, to earn money in different ways. Um, so really seeing that they have the power to make these changes, and if they had you know, more savings, the next time the rains come, they'll be able to do a better job of not just taking care of their community, but the people outside their community. Um, and uh, what Ms. Abdi said at the end of the day was, without us, without us women, more people would have died. So women have that capacity to care, to look beyond just their own family. They look to their community to see what they can do. And um, interestingly, this, this for me ties in very nicely with um, another story from the country of Niger, which is somewhat similar in certain ways because it is on the edge of um, climate change. There are kind of issues with respect to drought and with respect to um, uh, vulnerability for women um, and, and also conflict to some extent. Um, but in 1991, um, the very first VSLA was born. Um, it was called the Matumasu, Matamasu Dubara Group, and it was founded so that women would have cash to, pr to plant trees. Um, Matamasu Dubara, or MMD, means women on the move in Hausa. Um, so since that time, uh, almost 30 years, let's see, yeah, 30, I'm trying to think how many years ago, 27 years ago, I think it was. Um, since that time, 13.21% of women and girls aged 15 to 64 um, have joined these groups in Niger. 
uh, throughout the country, and they're now a major force. They have federations, and they actually have a national association um, of MMD groups. And they um, play an advocacy role. They also support women and girls. They've started a scholarship fund. They do things to support women in the country, and they advocate for women. But in the individual MMD groups, which are still being founded across Niger, women are doing business. Women are actually supporting their households and their communities. And in some places, this has enabled them to be more involved in decision making at a community level and to leverage their resources to make things happen. In one case in particular, there's a project called Dry Land Development that is supported by the Dutch government and implemented by ICRAF, and CARE is a key partner. Um, in some of the places where CARE works, in, in, sorry, in the places where CARE implements this project, they have started innovation platforms, which engage uh, community level innovators, farmers, et cetera, <coughs> to participate in and to um, actually uh, train, teach, uh, what shall I say, disseminate their best practices across different communities. And this is done through community radio. Um, I, I actually visited one of the communities where this is happening, and a guy came up with a couple of phones taped together, and he's interviewing people, which then gets broadcast. Uh, you know, he's recording people, and that gets broadcast out very excitingly. Um, but the interesting thing about it is that in this community, in one of the communities where I went, um, the women were sitting right in front of me, where you are all now. Um, and they were the first ones that I saw. The men were standing around the back, which is really very different from the social norms in many communities that you see in rural Niger. And um, one of the reasons for this was really because the MMD groups play a key role in these platforms. They actually finance a lot of these community initiatives. So they have a direct, uh, what shall I say, a direct vote in terms of, and a key vote in terms of how these things are implemented. So, um, you know, pointing out not just women's agency at the household level, but the wider community level and how their business makes a difference. Um, in, uh, in Mali, where there is an active conflict situation going on. We also have VSLA groups, and those are working on a number of different um, initiatives, one of which is that they are um, doing farmer field and business schools, which not only link um, farmers to markets, but they also improve, they enhance gender equity because they have modules talking about gender, they increase nutrition, and um, they adopt production techniques that are climate adaptive. They also, these groups, these women now also have a, a greater voice in terms of conflict mitigation in their communities and also in development planning. One last point uh, that I want to make is that CARE has recently um, worked with the um, UK government to develop a, uh, a publication called She is a Humanitarian Report. And that one really um, has looked at women's roles in humanitarian situations in Yemen, um, in, um, in the Middle East, and looked at how it's really important that women are engaged, that everyone is engaged in development, but that women's role is enhanced. Um, so a number of recommendations coming from that. Um, we need to bring the World Humanitarian Summit gender core commitments to the field level, and that involves women engage, women's engagement in peace building and addressing GBV in humanitarian situations. And these should include empowering women in food and nutrition security initiatives for households and communities. 
Um, identify individual and collective commitments on gender and leave no one behind at the leadership level in global clusters, humanitarian country teams, field clusters or sector working groups and national ministries. And this involves engaging women at higher levels in decision making on laws and norms that increase women's access to resources assets such as land and technical advisory services. Um, this is important to women's ability to support food and nutrition security of their families and communities. Strengthen and align approaches to whole of program cycle accountability for gender and leave no one behind measuring outcomes, not just processes in humanitarian funding. And this involves um, ensuring equal access to aid, but also to longer term benefits. Um, and then uh, giving humanitarian action a woman's face and appointing more female staff at all levels. Um, women often know better what to do to support, as I said, <laughs> to support food and nutrition security, but lack, may lack educational requirements, so we need to give more options for this. And then finally, strengthening partnerships with and increasing multi-year and flexible funding to local women's organizations in line with the wider grand bargain commitment to channel 25% of funding to local organizations. And as I've shown, there are many, many groups uh, of women who are forming organically, who are, um, have really tremendous you know, capacity and opportunities to make a difference in these environments. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. We'll turn over to Natasha now. Natasha, go ahead. Thank you. I will speak for seven minutes, so please bear with me. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour to my native home. I'm here from the International Center for Research uh, on Women, better known as ICRW, and I want to thank here um, CSIS for inviting us for such an important discussion and for thinking again about how important gender equality is to the work that we do, and also beyond food security. I'm not going to sing, uh, <laughs> otherwise I'm afraid you'll all leave the room, but I'm gonna start with a simple story, and that's the story of Sarah, a 15-year-old Syrian refugee who lives in Lebanon. And Sarah had to leave school because the conflict made it unsafe for her to attend school. And living in Lebanon now, her family is barely able to survive, to make ends meet, and to afford food. So to reduce the pressure on the family budget, and also to protect Sarah from sexual harassment and assault, Sarah, her family, marries off Sarah to a cosin. Now, Sarah has already a child and has no chance to go back to school. So Sarah is not alone. According to UNICEF, approximately one in five Syrian girls aged 15 to 19 is married today in Lebanon. Child marriage is a global phenomenon, and one that also affects one in five girls who are being married before the age of 18. Although child marriage is practiced in peacetime, a growing body of evidence and of research is now showing that its link to conflict is very strong. In fact, child marriage increases during violent conflict. Of the, of the top 10 countries where the child marriage prevalence is the highest, nine are considered fragile states. At the International Center for Research on Women, where um, I work, my research has examined how conflicts affect women and girls, and in a way that can be easily traceable to food instability and nutrition insecurity. In fact, food insecurity and malnutrition can be both a cause and a consequence of child uh, marriage. As you can see from Sarah's story, Discriminatory gender norms that undervalue women and girls' roles in the family and community intersects with food insecurity and poverty to create very powerful drivers of child marriage. In humanitarian contexts, for example, households are more likely to marry off their daughters because they face limited food resources due to greater food scarcity. Doing so reduces the burden on the limited food allocations because for the family it means that they have one less mouth to feed. 
It also means in certain cases that the family may gain in cash or in kind transfers from a bright price in exchange for the bride. In situation on conflicts, land also becomes scarce and because women and girls have limited access to land, including legal ownership and inheritance land, it further motivates families and some girls themselves to marry early. Alors, the dynamics by which conflict precipitates child marriage are much more nuanced than the picture I'm giving you now. Um, and just much more intricate again than just a simple act of getting rid of a daughter. Research does show that in times of conflict or disaster, child marriage is seen as a protection mechanism because with the weakening in, um, of public security and, um, and also of public services, families and also girls themselves tend to see it as a protection mechanism and as a way not only to access food but also as a way to be protected from sexual violence. Whatever the reason, the point is conflict exacerbates poverty and food insecurity and it is the compounding nature of discriminatory gender norms that determines how families and communities respond to a situation and often child marriage becomes a solution. The problem is that child marriage perpetuates the cycle of food insecurity and malnutrition by directly affecting the health and nutrition of child brides, but also of their offspring. Early marriage contributes to early sexual activity, early pregnancy, increased childbearing over time, and unhealthy birth spacing. Girls who bear children early have greater complications during childbirth and tend to have less healthy, less educated children than their peers who marry later. Girls who are married young experience higher rates of anemia, of malnutrition, of undernutrition than those who marry later in life. The mortality rate of children that are born to mothers under age 15 is almost 2.5 times higher than those born to older mothers. Children born to adolescent mothers are more likely to have low birth rate, suffer from poor nutritional status, and experience stunting. Alors, beyond these health effects, child marriage limits girls' empowerment. Why? Because they do not have the time to be educated, as we saw in the case of Sarah. They don't have the time to mature. They don't develop their self-esteem and also their status within the household, which would allow them to protect themselves, but also their children's nat uh, nutritional status. Women are, and girls are critical to food production and nutrition. They are the link that ensures many aspects of food production and nutritional security, as we've heard from our panelists. Child marriage threatens that link. And if we want to leverage women and girls' empowerment so that they can be agents of change, then let's just start by removing barriers that prevent them and their daughters in the first place to access land titling and inheritance rights so that they are not forced to depend on men to access land and to access food. More broadly, let's engage women in decision making, as it's been said over and over today, related to peacekeeping, empowering them by including women in decision making around reconstruction efforts such as budgeting, infrastructure development, irrigation, transports, access to land, access to markets, tools, technology, and also let's equip girls with the resources and the skills so that they too can have a voice, so that also they can strengthen their agency through education, through the strengthening of leadership and advocacy skills, so that they too can also be part of a Me Too movement to eradicate child marriage. Focusing on these areas will reduce time burdens for individual women and girls, it will increase their productivity, it will reinforce empowerment more broadly, and ultimately it will eradicate child marriage. To conclude, we must invest in women and girls, as we've said over and over. If we want to end global hunger and malnutrition in gender equitable ways, then programmers and policy office and, and policy makers must consider child marriage in both short-term humanitarian assistance, but also long-term development cooperation. Now, 
Just imagine, imagine if Sarah had been allowed to finish her education. She could have contributed more to her family's income. She would have delayed childbirth and would have fewer and healthier children. Now again, imagine if we just had one generation of, Sarah, of Sarah's with delayed childbirth, fewer healthier children. Just think of how a country would be transformed in just one generation. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. It's interesting that land titles and land reform has come up several times. I don't think people always think of that who are, that work slightly outside of the space. I'm very cognizant of the time. I know it's 1030. Um, so I'm going to ask for your forgiveness that we're not going to turn to the audience for questions. I am going to turn to Kavita and please give me five minutes to get her reactions and response. I'm also going to see if our speakers can stay a few minutes so that the audience is able to engage with them, but that we'll have to turn off the live webcast. So Kavita, love to get your thoughts and response on the things that you heard, some of the themes that were interwoven between, and just any additional feedback you'd like to give us final points. Um, sure, and I'm um, very mindful that the audience has been very patient with us, so um, I hope we do have some time to accept some uh, comments. a little bit. Um, I did put the term food sovereignty out there and we haven't talked about it so I want to push on that because I actually think um, it is one of the ways in which women are systematically disempowered. When large numbers of peasant women get together and say actually this term food security is a wrong term and if large institutions continue to use it it is actually disempowering. So that's one. Um, the second is that I think when we use the term gender analysis, which is used a lot, I would like to challenge us a little bit more to remind ourselves that gender analysis is not the same thing as women's rights. So gender analysis actually has to look at both men and women's roles in society. It is not about saying what is happening to women in conflict and you know, how is that different from what is happening to men? It's about actually looking at, that is why I brought up the issue of sexual violence. Sexual violence is embedded in a notion of what men's sexuality is and what women's sexuality is. And it does not just like magically appear at a time of conflict. So we have to really use that term very carefully. I think we use it very carelessly. It's very important for us to be concerned about how men see themselves in society, how they see their roles, what their expectations are. And I don't think we do a very good job as development people or as feminists, frankly, by assuming those two things are the same. They are not. Um, I have a big issue with the term empowerment. I don't use it. Um, power is always taken. Nobody gives you power. As somebody from a post-colonial country, I can tell you that. It was not like the British woke up one morning and were like, oh dear Indians, we are so sorry, we meant to actually give you your independence. No, that is not how it works. And that is not how it works for women. It's not like your country woke up one morning and was like, oh, we left out black people and women? Ah, sorry, sorry, we actually meant to empower you. But you know, no. So I really would like us to start using the word power, women's power, claiming our power, owning our power and taking that power back when that power has been taken away from us. So empowerment, nobody empowers anybody else. You work to make sure people take power. Um, third, I think this notion that, you know, we don't use the term feminism, maybe you have all forgotten sort of what it is, but again, I would argue, feminism has nothing to do with what is between your legs. Feminism has everything to do with what is between your ears. It is a way of thinking, it is an ideology of intersectional gender justice, not equality, justice. Equality has also a very slippery slope, you know. What are we trying to be equal to? Men don't have a, such a great time in the world either right now, sorry, but it's really true. Many men suffer, many men suffer under indignities that are extremely unfair. Patriarchy puts a huge burden on men in ways that I don't even think we have begun to unpack. So let's talk about it in a different way. 
Um, the personal is the political. I don't think it is very easy for us to be able to sort of have this you know, mass level analysis of how our institutions should become more uh, gender sensitive when then we go home and we are picking up the socks and making the food and planning the children's, you know, uh, baths and their, I mean, we have to be able to take some of that work back inside. And that's also true for men, because I think men are also not given the freedom to be fully who they want to be in the world by women themselves. Um, Lastly, I think I would like to talk a little bit about this notion of individual versus collective power. I like the idea of land titles and land rights, but it does not address the issue of the commons. It does not address the issue that water is not your water or my water, but our water. That air is not your water or my water. You cannot put a personal private property stamp on it and say that this is ours. And frankly, in countries like ours, where you know now they're trying to put a... a, a uh, what is that? What is it called? A patent on things that we've grown up with, you know, turmeric. Now that suddenly you've all decided it's the new superfood, it's going to be like branded by some company. No, we've all had turmeric in our lives for like thousands of years. Nice that you've woken up to it. We're glad to share it. But it doesn't need to have a, you know, it doesn't need to have a branded thing to it. So, and then lastly, I would just say I think about um, talking about girls more and young people more. I think we saw the power of them in an unbelievable way on Saturday. I think we have so much to learn from this next generation, and I'm really excited about the fact that if we shut up a little bit more as adults, we could hear their voices a little bit more. So those are some of my reactions and thoughts. Thank you. I do not want to end this conversation. I want to keep going actually for hours, but unfortunately I have an obligation to because of other events we have in this room. So we're going to, to end the live webcast now. Um, I will in, invite um, for like maybe two to three minutes, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna stop the official event um, to see if our other panels have us some other thoughts. But let's give a huge round of applause to our panelists. Thank you very much. So with the official webcast down, I'll, I'll just say, because um, I know people are going to have to go and we will have to get out of this room quickly, but I do want to turn